power systems. The adult equivalent of an imaginary kindergarten fight where you make pretend powers to beat their pretend powers. Yo. Uh, what, dude, what is it? Uh, so if I had this power of, like, this yeah. purple ball that I was able to fling at you and basically yeah. vaporize you, what would you do? Um, well, I would cut the ball in half so it wouldn't hit me. But I'm still there. Well, well no, I could just, it vaporizes it. No, but I cut the ball. Well, what how about mean? me? I'm still alive. I could just throw yeah, another one. Cut you, what are you talking about? No, well, well, I have this force field that I can never huh? get cut. I can never get touched. Okay, well, I'm not touching you if I'm splitting you apart directly. No, uh, no, I have- I. Okay, but seriously, what is a power system? A power system typically refers to the rules or mechanics governing the supernatural abilities possessed by characters within a particular series. These power systems often play a central role in the plot and character development. Some examples include... <gasps> Men in Hunter x Hunter, Stands in JoJo, Curse Energy in JJK, Devils in Contracts in Chainsaw Man, Quirks in My Hero Academia, and Breathing Techniques in Demon Slayer. Most authors use these power systems as a plot device to put their characters in sticky situations to leave readers or watchers in suspense, wondering how they will either triumph over it or succumb to their not-as-desired position. This idea is better known as writing your characters into a corner. An American show I know implemented this very well is Breaking Bad, specifically in Season 3, Episode 6. In this episode, both Walter and Jesse are trapped in a van with Hank right outside. This situation is obviously not ideal, but that is the entire point. While we're watching, the audience is constantly wondering how he will get out of this lose-lose situation. Walter eventually triumphs over this, but the journey to get to it is what makes this scene so powerful. A more anime-esque example can be seen in Vinland Saga season 2, where Canute invades the farm. It seems futile for Thorfinn to keep up his ideals of pacifism, but he does it anyways, and due to those solidified ideals, gains the respect of both Canute's army and Canute himself, with him deciding to stop his advancement. Again, writing your characters into a corner and figuring out creative ways for them to get out of it is what keeps the audience in suspense and waiting in anticipation. Power systems have a way to both let the author write their characters into a corner and as a way to help them get out of said corner, and if done correctly, can showcase masterful writing. If the authors are able to follow the rules of their set power system, it doesn't really feel like the authors are cheating their characters out of death but instead using their brains and wits to figure out ways around it. In my opinion, there are two ways writers can go about implementing these power systems into anime or mangas. The first method involves explaining the power system in extreme detail rather than surface level. This gives readers or watchers context to later plot points. This can commonly be seen in more complex power systems like Cursed Energy, Stance, and even Breathing Techniques in Demon Slayer. And while it could get pretty complex as the story progresses, it is the most believable and reliable, since from day one the audience is given a structure and context on how the power system works. The second method involves keeping the power systems in a shroud of mystery, only leaving breadcrumbs or hints on how a certain power system or character's powers work. This method can feel the closest to a deus ex machina, but if the author is able to explain it with enough context beforehand, can lead to very iconic scenes. Some that come to mind are Contracts and Devils in Chainsaw Man, Quirks in My Hero Academia, and maybe Breathing Techniques from Demon Slayer, but that might be a little bit of a stretch. Honestly, I have no idea where to put Demon Slayer. I'll let you guys decide in the comments. With that out of the way, today I wanted to talk about some instances that portray the idea of using power systems as a plot device, specifically in regards to putting their characters into a corner. So anyways, let's get started. I, I, have, this I have this barrier. You can't touch me. Yeah, well, I'll cut your barrier then. Well, then I'll push you away. My purple can go blue and red, and I can push you away with my blue. Yeah, and then I'll cut the blue, and then you what do you can't push. Do you can't. I can push away the blue. I can push no, away the cut but, with the blue. But the the blue gets cut away no, by my cut. No, so you no, can't, you can't push. No, yeah, no, yeah. yeah well, I, no, I get my red. Can... An easy instance of this that portrays this perfectly is in the fight with Makima, specifically how Denji was able to get the jump on her by making a double of himself or I guess Pochita, if you want to get exact, I don't fucking care. This may seem like a deus ex machina, since we have never seen him utilize his power until now, but if you read the manga, you actually know it was hinted beforehand. Before this fight, we were finally given context to one of the most mysterious characters in the show. No, it's not Makima, but actually Pochita. Pochita was introduced at the very beginning of the show and really wasn't mentioned too much after that, only being seen in a few instances. And when I first read the series, I always thought to myself, why wasn't there enough attention to Pochita? Yes, he is the animal mascot of the series, but for some reason people just gave him a pass, never really trying to look further into what they actually were. With this neglect, Fujimoto was able to provide one of the more compelling twists in the series, Pochita's true identity as the hero of hell, now unlocking the true potential of Chainsaw Man. 
Fujimoto was able to introduce different powers and abilities for them, specifically, their ability to throw their heart and regrow themselves around it. The reason why this doesn't feel like a cop-out is because of two things. Fujimoto intentionally left Pochita's true identity and their true powers ambiguous for a more powerful payoff later. It was vaguely, vaguely, vaguely hinted in the fight with the hybrids, but it was just enough for it to be believable. This, I believe, is what hiding a power system until the very end is at its finest, leaving just enough hints and breadcrumbs for attentive readers to have an idea of what will happen next, and more casual readers getting hyped as hell. And I'll be honest, I was one of those clueless motherfuckers, okay? I was like, how the fu- Oh! 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 That's how we did it. Got it. This reaction is what makes hiding a power system so good. If well-developed, can have a huge impact later down the road. Another one that is even better than this is in Attack on Titan. AOT already has a good track record of leaving mysteries and breadcrumbs for a big payoff later. But I'm sure at the time of release, no one was expecting this. It has been shown multiple times that people can turn into titans and also have unique abilities, like being big, having armor, or or being this weird golem creature. But something about Eren, not the titan, Eren, having the ability to control titans was unprecedented, with the only other instance being the beast titan, Zeke. For me, the main question was this, why now? Honestly, when I first watched this scene, it felt like a cop-out of a sticky situation, or a deus ex machina. And it was never fully explained, until they went into the basement. After making it there, not hyperbole, everything was revealed. The world, the origin of Titans, Marlins, and Eldians, quite literally flipping the whole world upside down. But what I want to focus on is the reveal of the royal blood descendant, Dina Fritz. Dina, Dina, have I been saying Dina the whole time? Dina, I'm taking this to the grave. Dina was Grisha's first wife, the mother of Zeke, killed Aaron's mother, and touched Aaron for his newfound power to activate. Wow, that is a <clears throat> pretty heavy track record. With this one character, everything that was confusing and not explained was seemingly put into place. She was, unfiguratively, the last piece of the puzzle we were missing. It explained Zeke's powers, Grisha's past, and why he made Aaron into a titan in the first place, why Aaron's power only worked that one and only time. All of it. And because most of the world was already a mystery since day one, the introduction of Dinah... Nope. The introduction of Dina feels more natural and realistic. Yes, she kinda came out of nowhere, but do you know what also came out of nowhere? Literally everything else in Grisha's diary. Because this whole reveal was seemingly out of nowhere, Dina's introduction felt like something that could honestly happen. Attack on Titan, I believe, is the best example I could think of when on the topic of power systems being not as detailed at the beginning, leaving only breadcrumbs for the audience to question, then having a huge impact later down the road. No! no. Yeah. yeah, what are you gonna do? What I, 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 you can't do anything anyways! I can't get touched by anything. Yeah, and no. what? It's separating you. It's not touching you. No, don't have to touch no, you. No, oh you. yeah, well, oh yeah, well, yeah, well my red can push you away. My red can push you away. Yeah, but can your red push away being cut in half? I didn't think so. It no, my red can push away your cut. No. One that quickly comes to mind is in Jujutsu Kaisen, specifically with Toji Zenin. Yeah, I said Zenin. What is he going to do? Come after me, guys? He died twice. Let the man rest. He he he's gone. He's good. He's good. He's gone. He's gone. Right? Anyways, Toji Zenin was a character introduced into Season 2, and is one of the few characters with no cursed energy. But due to his heavenly restriction, gained heightened senses, strength, speed, and much more. What I want to focus on specifically is when Toji gets the jump on Gojo. Before I do, let's break down this engagement. Gojo turns off his ability, gets jumped, and Aminai and Gato run into the barrier. Gojo gets surrounded and distracted by flyheads, and is bested by Toji. Kinda, but moving on. Finally, Aminai's death. While this part is again, super left field, every single part is already justified and explained with all the context and information given in Season 1, and some additional context we get from Season 2. Gojo at the time still had difficulty controlling his powers, specifically with his perpetual infinity. He has yet to figure out reverse curse technique, meaning he can't always have his infinity on like he does in Season 1. And since they were so close to their objective, Toji waited for him to let his guard down, then striked. The reason why Gojo was not able to see Toji at this moment was because of a combination of two things. The first one being the flyheads gathering around Gojo, making it impossible for him to see Toji's weapons and himself. The second one being Toji's heavenly restriction, 
Because of it, it made getting the jump on Gojo super easy. It was said that Tengen's barriers should alert people in the area of any unregistered cursed energy. But because Toji has none, the only things he had to worry about was his cursed weapons, which he kept in his body. Now, compared to my Attack on Titan and Chainsaw Man examples, Jujutsu Kaisen shows a mastery of the author's ability to stretch and manipulate their self-made power system, showcasing their ability to use it and put their characters into undeniably sticky situations. The next one I thought of was... Oh shit, wait, I don't have one. What day is it? Oh fuck, okay. Um... Okay, I need to call someone. Fuck, dude, I'm, I'm so late on this. Like, Jesus Christ, okay. Yo. A 900, what? What? Okay, anyways. Uh, how familiar are you with, uh, power systems? Okay, so at the end of Jojolian and part 8 of Jojo's, um, this is one thing that they did that was really cool. Uh, there's this guy called Toru, and he has this stand, because you know stands are in Jojo's, right? But there's this other force, this calamity that sort of exists. <clears throat> Alright, let's, uh... The main character, Josuke Higashikata, into a corner, where he can't do shit about it unless he actually finds a way- <coughs> Wow. <coughs> wow. Jesus this one loophole that's what gives him a fighting okay, chance yeah no, no wait hold on hold on just just save it for the yeah. video just save it for the video what video this... never mind just give it a second so jojo's has this system where characters pretty much have to embrace what already makes them strong to fight they can grow stronger but it's out of their hands because if they concentrate too much on what makes them strong it will change what they're doing for that moment and counteract their power one character, Jobin, is revealed to have a power that can pretty much take out anyone with time and focus. His philosophy was to gain more for himself without regard for shared resources like any systems of equivalent exchange. And he thought anyone should take what they can with their own power, no matter how many people weaker than them end up getting taken out to do so. But actual forces of equivalent exchange had been in the series since the previous story, and the major villains in this one were using them for power. So, sharing his worldview, Jobin was taken out by a version of his power that was acknowledged by the universe to be stronger, able to automatically scale up to multiple opponents instead of having to manually take them one at a time. This character, Toru, had the same ultimate power given to the main character of the previous story, where his stand could be a vessel for a larger and universal force. So, in order to overcome this, the main characters in this story had to take advantage of a part of the stand power system that had existed from the beginning, where, because stands are less about granting actual mechanics you could then train with, and more themes around the user's almost set-in-stone strength, they just had to make a new person with a power themed to counteract Torus, and fortunately, because of the circumstances of the main character, this could be done as an ability granted to him, and those trends from back in part 3 were what justified how they tied everything up. Oh, it can! Yes, it can! Yes, it can! Uh-huh, uh-huh. And then it splits it, no, and then it, it does! Splits. It does! No, no. Yeah. No. Nuh-uh. What are you gonna do about it? What What if while well, you're I, ready I don't need to do anything! I, I, at a certain point, power systems can get pretty complex and very convoluted but that is not to deny its ability to be immaculate plot devices if implemented correctly. Power systems provide a great means to move the plot forward, specifically to put characters into a corner. Whether they triumph or crumble from this given scenario is 100% up to the author, but regardless is what makes a power system so good. But anyways guys, that's the end of the video. As per usual, I'll leave some clips with some audio. Enjoy. These mini guns are so cool. The fuck is head dead. Oh, I'll probably be able to make it. Sounds good. Sounds good, Fred. All right. I'll talk to you later. What the fuck is that? Anyways, you guys have a great rest of your night. Take care. The audacity. <laughs> okay, that's crazy. He's going this way now. Yup! Put that there for a reason. The players go. He knows where I'm at. <laughs> <laughs> Try to get the fucking hamster going away. Thank you for that. Uh oh. Oh my god! This guy's terrible!
Holy shit! Oh, this is special.